and welcome back to Autism 30 and happy Autism Awareness Day. One of the reasons why I love today is because it gives the world an opportunity to understand autism because many people out there may have not heard the word autism before. And the fact that we all celebrate it globally with various places around the globe with lighting it up blue gives uh, people a time to note that autism exists, autism is a part of us, and autism is a part of the world, which makes uh, myself and my family very inclusive in this community. So I'm really, really grateful to all the efforts that are given globally to raise awareness with uh, people with autism. And I would also like to welcome uh, our wonderful parent panel, Tina and Jess here, who are celebrating the morning with us. And we are celebrating it ourselves at PAFN's Good Life Fitness Hub, who I want to personally say a big thank you to for supporting our podcast throughout this year. So I want to thank you, uh, the staff and community at the PAFN's Good Life Fitness Hub located at Richmond, British Columbia. And I want to welcome all of you who are visiting um, this location today as well. So welcome, Tina and and Jess. Yes, thanks for having us. And I want to ask you, Jess, what does Autism Awareness Day mean to you? Well, to us, it's a day of celebration. We're we're thrilled the day is here. It's always fun and happy. We will attend the celebrations at the Pacific Autism Family Network Hub. They have a big party every year, and we'll be there. Uh, we just enjoy, you know, being with our people and being in the building, and and um, the choirs performing, and we'll enjoy all the different activities that they set up for the kids. So for from a family perspective, we enjoy seeing our, our friends in the building and, and taking part of all of the different activities they have. From a global perspective, as you say, I really like World Autism Awareness Day because I like anything that shines a spotlight on autism. I want the world to be aware of us. I see awareness as step number one. I see uh, a day when we're not celebrating World Autism Awareness Day and we're celebrating World Autism Acceptance Day. I love that. <laughs> yes, that's brilliant. That's, you know, maybe let's is a couple of years out from now, but um, let's start with awareness. Sure. I, I love it. Let's let's bring awareness to autism. Let's educate the general public. I, I, I see long-term inclusion as a, as a goal in our schools, in our communities, in our workforce forces and if we start here so be it it's a starting point um let's we have a lot of work to do but um let's start here Absolutely. And I know uh, when I interview our community members who are an awful lot older, the difference in autism awareness from when they were starting out 20 years ago to where it is now. I mean, it is a long uh, journey, but progress has been made. And it's all because of days like today, which do shine a light on our community. So I agree with you, Jess. And what about you, Tina? Um, Well, I agree with everything that Jess said. And um, I will say that for us, it is a it is also a celebration day um, within ourselves. We don't really need awareness within our little family. We are very <laughs> no, aware of, of autism. Um, overall, I think one thing about Autism Awareness Day is that sometimes what's lost is that I generally don't need the world to know that there's autism. I feel like they do know there's autism, but they mm-hmm. don't understand autism. Mm-hmm. And I guess I guess that's where acceptance is going. But so my personal thing is that every year. I don't just promote Autism Awareness Day. I pick one little thing, one actual fact or piece of information that I want people to be aware of. Just being aware there's autism is not very helpful. So one year I made my Facebook post all about the signs of early signs of autism so that, you know, I was hoping my friends and family could advertise and share my post and other families could get diagnosed early and get access to services. Um, Another year I emphasized that it's not just enough to recognize autism. 
but to be very accepting when there's challenges in public. So if you see a child who's having a challenge or a struggle, not to assume that they're, you know, have bad behavior or bad parenting, but to be open to the fact that maybe that child has some challenges that you're not aware of and to have empathy and to maybe offer that parent, how can I help you? Or one of the most touching things, when my daughter was having a meltdown in Disneyland, someone just said, rub my back, total stranger, rub my back and said, you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Oh, the joy I felt like, you know, after all the stares from all the Disneyland people, I got that one moment of like, um, I just love, I just felt love. I just felt, you know, someone's love, someone got it. So to me, it's not just awareness of autism. It's awareness of all the different individual things that we want people to know about autism. And I agree because I mean, when my son started uh, school years ago, um, I know parents asked me, Oh, your child has autism. What's that? Mm -hmm. And we've come even a long way to the point of answering that one question to what you're suggesting is, Of course, it's a celebration day, and I'm so proud of our children. Um, But I really like the fact that you divide it up and kind of make it a mission statement to further educate the populace with with uh, a target that you Mm -hmm. set about very specific and individual things that you do to help our community, which is Mm -hmm. actually really good advice for myself, and I'm sure uh, Jess has taken note. If anyone's listening out there (laughs) and wants to emulate my new formula. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, I'm stealing that too, which yeah. is which is really great. And and I know for uh, those of you listening, I'm sure you have your own celebrations planned and your own tiny event um, or large event in the way that you feel that you want to celebrate it. But I know from myself from this podcast, I do want to reiterate the word that's been constantly used by Tina and both Jess and now myself: celebrate. I think our children and our community members and our community need to be celebrated because of the dignity and the joy that Mm -hmm. they have brought and the um, love that they're helping other people to feel within themselves. I know um, the uh, my son's English teacher sent me a beautiful letter home uh, last week and she said, what was lovely about the class is she said, um, she feels that my child was brought into that class so that other people can learn how to love. And because of my child, they are learning to develop a, a part of themselves which they didn't knew, know that they have. And that skill within themselves will lead to being better human beings out in, in the community. And I mm-hmm. thought that was lovely. So I'm sure. What a that, gift. What a gift. And I'm sure that our children and your children out there are doing just that. Mm -hmm. And for those people um, out there um, that are that might be having a rough time, I really want you um, to think today about the positive celebrations that are out there for our community. And hopefully, as Jess said, with it with time and and more um, awareness and acceptance, the celebration can be even bigger in yeah. future years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, now, I know within uh, the celebration of autism and stuff, um, which isn't a really educated word, but stuff pretty much <laughs> does cover it. Covers it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's aspects of autism, which I know many of us have questions about and and language and verbiage used and whatnot, because we parents here, like I'm sure you out there, want to keep autism in a positive and supportive light. Yet some of us kind of get um, confused or um, question the language that we use in reference to autism. So Tina, can you please uh, say one of those words where people kind of have different definitions for or that could be misconstrued so our audience can kind of be aware of the language that they choose to use when addressing our community members. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think sometimes language divides our community more than brings us together. Uh, sometimes kind of inappropriately, honestly. And sometimes I think the when people are bringing forward these issues, it actually moves the conversation forward and it helps all of us become more aware of, the, of how our language makes other people feel. But um, I know when you're just starting out on the autism journey, um, it might seem really confusing. Um, so 
some of the topics and things we can talk about now is whether whether someone uses the word autism versus autistic or verbal versus nonverbal versus non-speaking or things like high functioning, low functioning. So we just thought in this podcast, maybe we could just talk about some of those things in a really open, non-judgmental way, just because maybe you're at home and you've heard these terms, or maybe you know that there's controversy on, on how the terms are used, but you don't really understand why. And so, yeah, we just thought we'd delve right in, right? I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And, I, and I know that, that that's a question um, I have myself when addressing uh, podcast members, because I know even within this podcast, which has now been going on three years as of today, um, uh, people out there, um, I've gotten the same question where I should use one word versus the other. Mm -hmm. And that's only three years in and I'm confused as anybody. And, <laughs> and so I, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, welcome to the circus. We're all <laughs> confused. Yes. Well, I know, um, Jess, maybe you could jump in here and tell us a little bit about um, speaking versus non-speaking, verbal versus non-verbal. What's your take on these words? Yeah, thanks. So my take on the words, and this is personal to me, is, and, and, and it's not like I'm brilliant and thought of this myself. I read it somewhere, I'm sure. Um, I used to refer to my child as non-verbal because my child doesn't speak. She does make a lot of sounds, verbalizations, word approximations, etc. Um, and so, and I feel like verbal or nonverbal is usually what you get asked. So for ages, that's how I referred to her. And I read somewhere once um, some self-advocates were writing about it and um, preferred the term non-speaking. Um, mostly because it's just more accurate. Like I said, my daughter does vocalize. She has a lot of word approximation. So words that um, you can kind of make out as 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 words like ma 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 from for mm -hmm. mama as 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 I refer to myself. So so there are sounds, there are vocalizations, there are verbalizations. So there is a there is a verbal capacity. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, there's no expressive speech. Um, there's no there's no sentences. There's things like that. So we prefer the terms non-speaking. Um, if somebody were to ask me, is your child verbal or nonverbal? I would say she's non-speaking. If I said, what about you? And they said, oh, my child's nonverbal. I wouldn't correct them and say, I think you mean your child's non-speaking. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> obviously it's their choice to say whatever they want to say and they know their child better. So I think for this one in particular, there's, <clears throat> I prefer non-speaking. Um, I feel that it's more accurate. Um, I've sort of picked up on it in, um, social media self-advocate type groups is the du jour uh, words. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm behind. But I, I don't feel like saying somebody's nonverbal is disrespectful in any way or demeans them or takes away any of their power. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that way, it's a to me this is a kind of a neutral one so it's a good place to start because there's not a lot of weight <laughs> on either side although it's interesting because it's such a dichotomy verbal nonverbal, speaking non-speaking yeah, sure. and my challenge is that i have a daughter who can um, sing she can make sentences she scripts a lot so kind of an echolalic kind of situation but she doesn't have a lot of expressive speech and so she has a hard time forming sentences that are do a good job of communicating to us what she's thinking, feeling. Uh, she's pretty good about requests. I think there's a lot of oomph <laughs> behind a request. Um, so requests are pretty good and negotiation is getting good. Um, and she's got some commenting. But, you know, in an emergency situation, you couldn't count on her to express her needs. Mm -hmm. And yes. if you ask her, like, what she did in the day, you'll be very lucky if you get any answer. You might get friends or writing or so when someone asks me is she verbal or nonverbal you know I feel like I need to give them a paragraph answer because mm -hmm. that doesn't really encapsulate it and so I don't know if there should be some sort of medium word or I guess not medium speaking I don't know it just gets <laughs> so hard sometimes because our kids are they're all so different and they're all so special yes. and they're so individual I guess I, there's not a word for every kid, but I kind of sometimes wish there was. <laughs> so there is, you know, no, you yeah. have to give that paragraph every time because, because you have to explain and there is no singular word to define how your child is. But what I'm always interested in is the, what is the question behind the question? Mm. So often what I find is the question is, is your child verbal or nonverbal or speaking and or non-speaking? 
the actual question behind that is a subtle assessment of how um functioning how functioning how how independent how mm-hmm. you know oh, there, there there's a subtle assessment behind that of where does your child stand within the spectrum mm. of autism is how i <laughs> yes. hear when people say oh is your child verbal or nonverbal mm-hmm. and i think what you're really trying to ask me is dot yeah, dot dot yeah so, and so, that's where we're going to go in a minute yeah, but yeah. i just want to make sure we get tallies <laughs> what yes. do you think about the speaking non speaking well uh, as i said before i know in interviewing many community members and many people out there in community I get two different thoughts so uh, uh, on both camps actually but I'm going to ask you just since mm-hmm. you're sitting right in front of me mm-hmm. because you have cl- uh, you have clear um, ideas about your feelings on the matter mm-hmm. if I as a parent came up to you and said um, I want to know what would be the correct term to use um, do you call your your child nonverbal or non-speaking mm-hmm. and which one would you classify her as being would you be insulted by my question not at all not at all i i would not be um i think that it's kind of hard to insult me actually so maybe i can't <laughs> oh is that for, a challenge <laughs> i can't speak for everybody maybe but uh but no, I would not be insulted by the I, I would actually like that question because it would show that you're showing respect for my feelings around that matter and more importantly, my child's feelings around that. Um, and then I would answer the question that, you know, and I reserve the right to change my mind at some point uh-huh. in the future. So we currently use not speaking and uh, I think that asking people is a great way to start. So, you know, do you prefer nonverbal or or do you prefer non-speaking do you prefer autism versus autistic or whatever whatever and yes. asking people what they prefer um, and what they like to use in their home or with their families I think is a great place just to start from from a place of respect okay mm-hmm. so so uh, that then we can inform our audience members out there that a good place to start is not by a statement it's by a question mm-hmm. geared towards the parent that's yeah. involved comes down to preference and, and one of the things that I absolutely loved of what you said um uh you said out of respect for my child because Mm -hmm. i think that often um people will address the parent and negate the feelings of the children around or ignore that they're no longer there or don't have a voice to speak up for themselves so i think the fact that you actually acknowledged that your child um has thoughts and feelings (laughs) surrounding that well she's not speaking but she's not non-hearing exactly she hears you she hears your question she's whip smart and she understands the inclin the the sort of the question behind the question as i mentioned before um and so absolutely she can feel whether or not you're being respectful or disrespectful and because she's not speaking and because she's young she's six years old um you know i find that um six-year-olds themselves probably don't get a ton of respect a non-speaking autistic uh, six-year-old is not getting a ton of respect necessarily so um, I'm here to say that's not cool like y- you know respect uh, it's nice mm-hmm. for me to be respected but I need you to respect my child so when people ask me questions that should be directed to my kid they'll say oh does you know so-and-so want a cookie I'll say well I don't know ask her do you want a cookie? You know, she can answer you. Which is really good advice. And I would actually add one further based on what you said as a prior teacher. Um, you said that six-year-olds don't really, uh, are offered an awful lot of respect. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm here to say that that's completely inaccurate because children will do what they're taught. So if you teach children at the age of six a language of disrespect, they will follow through on yeah. dis- disrespect. So if you teach a child of six, as, as the age you're using, yeah. respect, they will learn to emulate that and then follow yeah. through on it. And I think the same goes, as you're beautifully saying, for our community members. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm sure you feel the same way, Tina. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Um... And, and, and what's another uh, topic? I know we've had these topics outside of the podcast as well. Mm. What's the other kind of terminology which can be a real hot button yeah. in our well, community? Well, we have two we want to tackle. I'm of two minds which one to go first. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is high functioning versus low functioning. Um, and that deals with also talking about the spectrum, uh, the spectrum disorder and the terminology around that. And the other one is autism versus autistic. Uh, both 
you know, pretty hot button. Yes. Um, maybe we'll start with the autism versus autistic. Um, I'll just give a little bit of an opener and then we'll see what everyone thinks. OK, mm-hmm. so just as some background, if you're a listener, you might be wondering, well, what does it matter if I say has autism or autistic? I certainly know in my journey the first time I heard this was even a thing, I couldn't believe it was a thing. And then I found out how much of a thing it really is. Mm -hmm. And some people really, it's very, very important to them. So just know that sometimes when you're talking to someone and this is a very important thing to them, ask the question and then be respectful and and go along with what they believe. And, um, you know, probably time and place. Not every time is the time to get into a giant debate about it. Just, Just show your respect and then, and find what you can connect over. But For people who don't understand it, I think sometimes someone just has to explicitly explain it. And so in this case, you know, some people value um, first person language. So in that way, it's autistic. So they would say, I am autistic or my child is autistic. And um, the other alternative is to say has autism. So my child has autism or I have autism. So um, the has autism, I think, comes from families I feel like it's often the parents that are purporting this uh, way of thinking, saying that autism doesn't define my child, right? So, Mm. um, you know, just it's a medical condition. Um, So, I mean, it gets confusing because some people say like, oh, I say have diabetes. But we actually also say diabetic, (laughs) right? Yes. And like has seizures, we also say epileptic. But overall people like to think that their medical disorders don't define them and so that's where the has autism i think has its roots yes and then um autistic yeah it's, it's just a different mindset i don't know do you want to jump in jess and tell us um where the self-advocates fall and why they like autistic sure so and and again this is not me being like oh i i am so i am so wise i've come to these conclusions myself no i just read a lot so what i have read from self advocates is um the the reason why many prefer autistic versus has autism is the um the thought process behind that is that um autism is how you're neurologically wired it is how your brain um, thinks so therefore it is who you are how you are your cells in your body your DNA how how you feel navigating this world how you think uh, how you move so it's so ingrained it's such a part of you it's how so much of who you are and how you are in this space in this world that um, you are autistic you are seeing the world through autistic eyes you are feeling the world through autistic uh, body and so um that is my very layman's um neurotypical Mm -hmm. understanding of the word and the reason behind choosing the identity uh Mm -hmm. stance of of autistic and i actually use both um interchangeably at, at this point until my daughter can speak for herself and let us know what she prefers I'll probably continue to do that I think as we said at the top of the podcast it, it's come it comes down to someone's preference so some self-advocates prefer autistic some prefer with autism I think if your kid um, can tell you which they prefer you know go with whatever your however your kid wants to define themselves and if they're unable to tell you my daughter's unable to tell me what she prefers so right now we're kind of interchangeable depending on you know how it phrases in the sentence at the time Um, (laughs) which is understandable yeah so but that's 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 my layman's understanding of Mm. why there there is that choice there and I think it's a very personal choice and, and I do agree it's a personal choice. I know with the people that I've met um, in the podcast, as I said, I've heard um, information and reasonings for both camps. One of the reasons why on this podcast you'll often hear me talk about community members is I feel um, people with autism or autistics are part of the community. That's my feel, and that pretty much in my head describes it effectively. But if I have to choose to use the word 
autism autistic to describe to somebody i know um, that before a podcast starts i will certainly or if i'm meeting somebody in person i will certainly ask them specifically in a respectful way um, which they prefer to be addressed as just like when i asked you the question earlier and i don't know if some of you have read my march newsletter um, for those of you that aren't aware i do a monthly newsletter for autism 30 and you can subscribe to that newsletter by going to our website and going down to the bottom of that page and clicking the word subscribe and fill in all your details and you can also unsubscribe at any time one of the things that I mentioned in the in the last newsletter is upon getting the diagnosis of autism you end up in battles you never thought you would ever face and I believe this uh, issue what we're talking about right now is one of those battles where you don't understand um, an awful lot of why language is so important but it hits you really hard really really fast so you have to do a lot of reading and educating yourself about these topics alongside with everything else you have to do when the diagnosis lands on your lap so as much as you would like to say just in layman's terms you actually also did mention that you did a lot of reading upon mm -hmm. the subject yeah. you didn't just address it by how you feel in the day you do come from an educated perspective and I know Tina you've been part of the community for so long mm -hmm. and you've spoken and you're extremely well read as well so your perspective is coming from an educated point of view so for those parents out there that haven't read an awful lot of material out there based on these uh, issues from two parents sitting here and myself you're getting um, a varied um, message of why language is really really important and how respecting our community and community members by the words and language and questions that you choose can affect somebody yeah mm -hmm. well i think you know when we're talking about that respect and how it can function uh, how it can affect someone i think the the last term that we wanted to talk about high functioning versus low functioning is is really a great topic to talk about because I agree. of all the topics we've talked about i feel like this one really has the most power behind it power to hurt power to be empowering that's a weird sentence and um <laughs> also i just think it's something that people don't realize is hurtful mm -hmm. but a little bit of information can be very helpful mm -hmm. so you know, um, oftentimes we talk about autism as a spectrum, and I agree, um, it is a, it's absolutely a spectrum, and our kids come in all shapes and sizes and different profiles in terms of their strengths and their challenges. But sometimes when we think of spectrum, we think of it kind of like a, a scale or a line with on one side is low functioning and one side is high functioning. And I will get Jess to jump in in a second, talk about the challenges with those terminologies, but I just want to quickly say that I prefer to think of it um, as more of a color spectrum and I, I didn't create this they're all over the internet some great smarter people than me <laughs> did but if you think of a crystal and how light comes into a crystal and then comes out in a spectrum of light you know Roy G. Biv as we all learned mm -hmm. and each of those colors represents a different thing that our kids um, maybe are good at or can struggle with so everything from language regulation um, uh, communication um, Help executive, me out, guys. Executive functioning. Executive function, um, sensory processing disorder, mm -hmm. social skills, all those different aspects. And any kid could have a very different profile. So they could be strong in some areas and not in others. And so it's important to understand each child is a unique mosaic of color to see where they need support and where they can be strengthened and celebrated and can do great things. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, but Jess, I do want to you know, t-ball it over to you to talk about the high functioning, low functioning terminology. Thank you. I'll do my best not to get on a soapbox about this because this, this is one with the others. I'm kind of, like I said, I'm fairly neutral, use them interchangeably, you know, cause I feel like, uh, it comes down to personal preference. <clears throat> high functioning and low functioning on the other hand, I feel like are more loaded. Like to me, the difference between has autism and is autistic, one, one is not necessarily disparaging. Uh, one is or is not. It's just a, it's just a preference. Um, a same non-speaking, non-verbal. One might be slightly more accurate, depending on the kid, of course. Um, but certainly using non-verbal doesn't disrespect anybody. Low functioning, on the other hand, I feel... 
um, my personal opinion, I feel that it's, uh, I feel that it is very disrespectful. It, what it does is it strips the person being labeled of, of, of their dignity. It takes away all of the things that they're good at. It, it labels them, it brands them with this idea that they're, um, that they're not good at anything. Um, low functioning, like really roll that around on your tongue for a second and think about, how you would feel to be called that somebody like my daughter who's non-speaking um but incredibly wise and thoughtful and you know emotionally you know in in tune with herself to hear those words directed at her I can only imagine the breadth of hurt that 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 Mm -hmm. she would feel without question so low functioning so what and what does that mean I remember speaking to one of our professional therapists um saying you know we had this discussion about the word and she said well actually that's interesting um and and in her words she said I I wouldn't suggest at all that your child is low functioning she said I would say she's low verbal um but not low functioning so I think a lot of times and this could be why it's a hot button topic for me in particular, because my child is not speaking, is that a child is thought to be low functioning simply when they don't speak. Mm -hmm. And you're not looking at the wider picture of things. So I've, you know, been around many families where um, their child is highly articulate, but is unable to regulate, has extreme anxiety, is um <clears throat> you name it issue this issue that mm-hmm. um and because the child is articulate and can express himself verbally they're considered high functioning whereas my child is very regulated and calm and open to new experiences and extremely flexible and all these things that make our life so easy touch wood um but yet because our child doesn't speak there can be uh a tendency to label them to label her as as low functioning and so for me personally it's a personal issue I feel like that's really again quite inaccurate but but even regardless of if uh, 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 of my personal circumstance more generally speaking if a child requires a lot of support is not independent has issues with regulation has issues with anxiety has issues with communication has issues with Self-care. personal care mm-hmm. you know all of these things so by all intents and purposes um is quote low functioning in every checks every low functioning box would you still pr- refer to this person as low functioning and i say mm-hmm. no so you might be saying well what how do i describe this person i i personally use the words um requires support or when I'm talking about somebody who's quote high functioning I have often used the phrase um, is highly independent Um, what I have read again from self-advocates is that um, and this is not my quote and I, I, I would love to credit the person who said this but I don't know who it is who said that the problems with the phrases high functioning and low functioning is that the phrase low functioning strips any expectation away that you would have of this person and presumes they're incompetent regardless of what they could accomplish and the phrase high wow. function yeah right like mm-hmm. that's just that's that to lay it out bare you are you're basically saying my standards are lower for you mm-hmm. my expectations are lower for you yes and that's heartbreaking. So without doubt, that's heartbreaking. Think about that. And then, but the problem actually of labeling somebody as high functioning, because I thought, well, what could be the problem? Of, isn't that a huge compliment? It's like, you're so smart. You're so great. But, but the problem with labeling someone as high functioning, according to these self-advocates that I was reading, is that it strips them from... It unrealistically uh, increases expectations. Yes, it un- yes. It, absolutely. And it, it strips them it, the, it, from it, the supports it, they need. It implies yes, that they absolutely. don't need support. It implies, too, that your functioning is even across the board. So you mm-hmm. had mentioned the spectrum, mm-hmm. which some people see as a scale from high to low, as opposed to a prism that is that is great. I love the visual of the so of the I. colors coming through yeah, the go crystal. Go Google it, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely. Whereas, again, somebody who might be quote, high functioning, or as I prefer to say, highly independent, um, 
that may not be across the board. You could be, you could be highly articulate, have great executive functioning, but you could have, you could really struggle with social skills, you know, so as opposed to these big, fat, broad labels of high and low, Mm -hmm. which are, I will argue, are absolutely not helpful in in any way, because you can't be high in everything and low in everything. No one, nobody is as great at everything or bad at everything. That's, that doesn't define any, that's no one's profile. Absolutely. And and keeping on what uh, the beautiful visual that Tina actually gave at the beginning. I know I've spoken about it on many podcasts, but I have a strong passion for astronomy. And uh, like Tina was saying, um, that uh, with our sun, you go through the spectrum of colors in in, uh, a certain order. And when you look at our sun's light through a prism, you see the colors pretty much equally distributed amongst them. And you there's also colors there which aren't there to the visual eye which go off the spectrum Mm -hmm. and I don't know how many of you are actually aware out there but all the stars in in our universe if you shone their light through the prism they would give a very different account based on the elements that they're made up from so that the elements that the star is made up from will give breaks in the prism they'll give larger blocks of the of of color depending on what element is a major is a major factor in its light and taken your analogy of prism with light and taken just from what you were saying Mm -hmm. if we could think of our children like the stars in the sky where each of them is made up of exactly the same composition but each have their own um, light that they shine Mm -hmm. and that they're all different Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that one is less or the other. They're just different and they have value in our solar system. And uh, they're needed to shine in the night sky. And without them, we'd live in absolute darkness. So when we're thinking of our community members, correct me if I'm wrong, and if Mm. you would agree with this, is that instead of saying high functioning or low functioning, um, we just, uh, you know, call them either people on the spectrum or um i don't i don't want to use the term autistic or with autism yeah but also take into account the the sentence that you used mm-hmm. um, about expectations placed on our mm-hmm. children as a teacher i'm a strong believer that a child regardless of their ability will always meet your expectations Absolutely. so if your expectations mm-hmm. are low of that child yeah. they will certainly meet them and if your expectations are high of that child they will certainly meet them or strive to or strive to right? exactly At least strive to Because I know, like I'm sure many of you have, have read articles upon articles about our community members where doctors have told them, oh, they'll never speak again, Mm. put them in an institution. Boo. Uh, (laughs) I would agree with the boo, where all of a sudden, years later, they're speaking and they're fully functioning Mm. members of society. And it's it's because of the expectations placed around them. Mm. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. No, not Uh, at all. Well, first of all, thank you for that cosmic journey. I was yeah, it's very pretty. Thinking about space. And Sorry, my nerdy and, no, astronomy. I loved journey. it. I loved it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this quite fits in, but something I was thinking about when uh, Jess was talking is about how sometimes I think when families are first diagnosed, they hold on to that high functioning mm-hmm. label as a, as a good. badge, and and I get that, but for me, like. I had a crash and burn moment where I realized that maybe my daughter wasn't meeting my expectations. And a lot of that came from having unrealistic expectations to begin with. And Mm -hmm. so as a parent, you may want to hold on to that. Oh, well, at least my child is high functioning. It's not like one of those kids. Yeah, exactly. But really, again, it's it this gets into a bigger issue because what divides us this whole topic is about language and terminology and how sometimes it breaks the breaks us apart versus brings us together as a community the challenge here is that the break is not just the language we use to describe kids that need more support but also the fact that our kids have disparate needs yes. and yes. so sometimes that in itself breaks the community in terms of what we need, what we don't need, um, how we should be looked at, and should all our kids be considered together or separately, and where is the line? And I mean, that's a whole nother podcast. But, but at least if we can come together on using respectful terminology, yeah. that starts to bridge that gap. And I guess the last thing I was hoping we talk about with this sort of 
languages and things that divide us is if maybe each of us can give a story about a time when you were faced with a challenge where maybe you came into a situation where you had someone who had a different perspective or a different uh, idea about something and and how you met that challenge and I'm sure you all handled it beautifully but Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any suggestions for people you know if they if they come in you know maybe they strongly believe in one of these terms and they meet someone who has a different term. Well, well, I know um, when I interview uh, my guests for this podcast, as I said, I, I, I meet people who have two varying opinions. And I think what I've learned through that is to really communicate um, and ask questions with uh, my podcast guests to find out where their views are. Because um, I like to be respectful of my guests and my audience members and grant their wishes. Um, based on what they would want to, uh, because I certainly do not want to disrespect um, the community members or their parents or our community in general. And um, I call I call the end of the podcast "Live and Love" for a purpose mm-hmm. and a reason, because I hope by having conversations like this, we can learn to love together and and mesh our community together instead of. Um, uh, having topics like these and issues like this divide us so Mm -hmm. hopefully um, with speaking about this issue today on autism awareness day we'll bond our community Mm -hmm. closer together and and learn to see things from the other person's perspective Mm -hmm. to gain understanding Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what about you jess yeah it's a great question i think um if i could take a sec to share a couple uh, a story so my uh, uh, first of all, how I would respond would very much depend on the, the situation. So who are these people to me? Do Am I going to see them again? Am I not? Do I care? Do I not care? Is my kid there? So if, if um, terminology is being used in front of my kid that I feel is disrespectful to her, I would 100% say, say something in a way that um, doesn't necessarily – create an issue but is clear about wh- where we stand um and I can't remember if it was this podcast or the or the one yesterday but talking about how respecting my child's um point of view and she's not speaking but she's certainly hearing so very she, true <laughs> she can hear you and she can understand um your if if you're disrespecting her or disdain or or, or, or any any of the above I would certainly um, correct that. But I think in general, I, I try to know that you can't, yeah, you can fight some battles. You can't win the war, you know, or whatever the expression is. I'm sure I Mm -hmm. butchered it there, but, um, I pick my battles (laughs) is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, I, I have been in parent groups where it's just parents, there's no kids around. Um, and parents have used expressions that I feel are, Oh, I'm guilty. Disrespectful. Yeah, and I and I'll jump I, in and say, hey, just I, I, I don't um, I try and, and say it as nicely as I can say, hey, so when you say the, the phrase low functioning, here's what I hear and here's why I think it's problematic. And here's why I'm requesting mm-hmm. that we use a different phrase and we would say X instead of Y. Uh, I have I have done that before. I've also um, bit my tongue before because I feel like, oh, it's not the time. It's not the place or mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, clearly, I've forgotten the um, original question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's OK. You're, you're filling the time great. It was just about if you've ever had a, you know, a disagreement with somebody, you know, either about language or something that divides our community and just what how about, you challenge What about it. you, Tina? Because we're running out of time, Yeah, I know. I know. I think we could talk about this topic f- for forever. forever. I, and there's I a know. lot more topics that divide our community that I think the Parent Talk people... I mean, us would be great at, but um, and I agree that yeah. we want to get out and celebrate oh, I know. today. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, yeah. Well, I'll just say that I have just done my best to like try to listen and see what the other person is coming from. Um, I feel like if it's something that I'm really well read about, I'll maybe be more um, advocacy. Mm -hmm. And if it's something I've never heard of before, I will more like bite my tongue and want to learn. And, you know, we're all on a journey. And so, I mean, I admit I've sometimes just the words stumble out of your mouth and they just are not the right words. And so words that I don't endorse, I have still used because 
I, it's just, I'm just trying to, usually it's about, I've got some other bigger point to yeah. make yeah. and yes. this is just a stumbling yeah. block. And so we're all imperfect. And so my parting words are just that, you know, think about the people that you're speaking with and the question behind the question and all these things. But, you know, are they coming from a place of love mm-hmm. or are they coming from a, you know, are they your peeps? Are they your family? Are they your friends? And just allow everyone to make mistakes and then move forward and educate. And I think as a community, we should try not to let words divide us. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of other challenges of ahead and we are stronger together. So we need to work together. And it's important to have these discussions. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, we need to all group hug and work on where the real challenges are. Yeah, I agree. Can I I add to that? Oh, mm. sorry, Tally. Can I add to that? Oh, absolutely. Just because I have, I've had other parents, I think what you said is like, are they coming from a place of love? And that's, that's key. So I've had uh, parents ask questions and then say, um, uh, basically what their question is trying to get at is, you know, um, is your point of view valid because my child's so high functioning our children must be so different therefore this is a question so how I will often respond is something like we don't use functioning language in our home but I understand what you're asking and what you're asking is and then I may lay out um my understanding of the question which is really what they're trying to get at and so uh, it does take longer it's more words it's like a paragraph or like trying to describe mm-hmm. the situation so it, it's not as easy it's very wordy but I, I I feel like I honor our family and I honor my kid by saying right up front we don't use functioning language and here's why but I feel like I try then to honor and keep our community together and keep parents in this group hug by saying I understand the intention behind your question and what you're driving at and what you need to know. So you're asking because you love your kid and you really just need this piece of information to best support your child. And for that, I'm going to acknowledge that and give you the answer you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've said my piece, but I've also followed that up with, I see you, I hear you. And here's what I think, here's the answer to the question you're looking for. Cause I I agree. I don't think words should divide us. We, we are stronger together. Like you say, I love that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I think in conclusion, correct me if I'm wrong is I know personally, I like to surround myself with people who think differently than me because it challenges my own thoughts and it allows me to grow as a person. And I think that, um, that keeping a different perspective um, broadens my horizons and my views and allows me to see the world in a different light. It might challenge my belief systems and and it allows me to grow. Therefore, just because somebody might have a a different idea to mine, um, you welcome their ideas into your brain and think about them. um, But you also know where you stand for your family, for yourself, for your child, for your community. On that note, language and words and terminologies used, I think is a really great conversation point like we've done in the podcast today to speak about to speak about it with members of our community. So instead of it being a dividing point, let it be a conversation that brings us together. And maybe uh, for Autism Awareness Day, maybe this conversation in your own community can actually allow you to see things from a different perspective with each other and allow greater bonds wherever you are to form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank you, Tina, and thank you, Jess, for joining us once again on the Parent Talk Always so much fun, yeah. Well, I'm glad and I hope out there you've had fun as well. And if you would like to contact Autism 30, you can do so by going to our website at autism30.com. And if you are joining us on iTunes, please don't forget to click and write a review. And I hope all of you out there are having a wonderful Autism Awareness Day. And let's all celebrate today. Woohoo! Yeah. (laughs) Once again, this is Tally telling you to live in love. Hey, yo, I'm an autist. Awareness angel, making sure my wings protect the different, the stranger than I'm an autism. Awareness angel is good, cause I'm cool with the unique behavior. I'm an autism. Awareness angel, will you accept me? Cause I accept you. I'm an autism. Awareness angel, cause the view from the spectrum is a better point.